Hello everyone, welcome to the Game Design Perspective. I'm Santi. Disclaimer, before everything, uh, this is my opinion, my opinion alone, but this is an opinion that I've been wanting to say for a long time. I do not represent my previous employers or my future employers or my current employer of any kind. This is just my opinion, my opinion alone. I'm currently in um, Barcelona. I currently move here to work at IU Interactive and it has been a mess. Yeah, here I am now trying to be back into the channel. And all these weeks, there's been this talk lately. There's been a lot of game releases. Uh, Final Fantasy VII Rebirth came out. Uh, Dragon's Dogma came out uh, with a lot of controversy. Helldivers has been a fantastic experience. Uh, there's been a lot of layoffs all over the industry. The majority have been through what we call, they have been done by what we call AAA studios. And it just got me thinking lately, and it has been a pet peeve of mine for the longest time. Back in the PlayStation 2 era, I think uh, we didn't have terms like indie or AAA. We would have online games, small flash games, or we would have console games or PC games, but we wouldn't separate games by budget or scope because that's literally what we're doing here when we separate from AAA, indie, and now currently the AA and the infamous quadrant a that ubisoft mentioned and when ubisoft did that it just like pushed me a little bit over the edge i used to work at ubisoft and i saw behind the scenes how how they operate and the things they do i don't think every team is the same but my experience in far cry 6 was very eye-opening in many ways i had to talk about it i had to talk about the quadruple a comment that Ubisoft made and probably what the title of the video should be is that the term tri uh, triple A should not exist and the reason is because it's incredibly fluid it is just in reality it doesn't exist it's a marketing thing that was used to sell big budget games or over scoped overly expensive games to to the people you know is that hey this is a triple a experience and this is a triple a game and i don't think that shouldn't exist because four reasons let's talk about them number one is that the budget boundaries do not exist there is no publisher there is no developer or there is no venture capitalist that has a proper guideline that says this amount of money constitutes a triple a game it's non-existent there is no category that says an indie game needs to be this budget what we call indie games are many times not even independent they have publishers that put money so the only real difference between indie and triple a is their budget maybe but what does it constitute indie right like when i was when i was hired in io interactive the first thing they they told me as a joke but it's real is that they are the biggest indie in the world and it's true they're fully independent and that makes them indie technically by definition of what independent is right they bought themselves from Square Enix, and they've been fully independent for some time. So technically, the Hitman games are indie games, but their budgets and their scope is not indie at all, right? So what constitutes an indie game? Re the reality is that it's just the budget that makes it different. And now, currently, we have double what we consider double A games and how important double A games are for the industry, right? And the difference is always budget. That's the main difference. The indie market, the double A market, triple A market is budget. That's it. And we make a clear distinction with these tags that didn't exist before. But if that's the case, what changes in development between AA, AAA, and Indie? Well, the reality is that the only thing that truly changes is the attitude. Is there attitude towards money? Is there attitude towards development? Is there attitude towards anything? That's it. Indies need to scramble to get money or they need to be extremely efficient because their scopes are tight. 
or small. So indies value time and money uh, more than anything. They're usually small teams or solo developers with grandiose ideas to bring their game to fruition with innovation and honestly restrictions. So they're very, very meticulous in that sense. While AAA projects tend their attitude, well, it tends to be throwing money at problems and hoping they, they get fixed. And the reason is because they, it's very difficult to pivot on a AAA game. But again, what's a AAA game, right? So this brings the next problem. And that point number two is budget is completely disconnected of the design. What do I mean by this? The design of a game does not indicate the budget of a game, does not indicate the scope of a game really, or like how much money it needs to be developed. The reality is that the design is sometimes the last thing that dictates the scope of a, of a project, especially in big budget projects. So let's grab two examples that I personally worked on that I was like there with the development team that I can educately tell you about. There are similar projects in some, in the case that they're the same genre. They were made in proprietary engines and their development can be somewhat similar. Their mechanics are similar. There's a lot of similarities, a lot of parallels, even the attitude that weapons are made with the scrap material, right? So that would be uh, Metro Exodus and Far Cry 6. So despite some of their similarities, their scope is completely different. And to understand this, let's put some numbers in the equation, right? So the budget, of course, the budget of, of the scope of Far Cry 6 as a game is bigger than Metro, but it's not significantly bigger if you think about it. Yeah, Far Cry 6 might have co-op, but it's never its goal. And if you treat them as a single player game in a way, they're first person shooters, story. I think Metro has more dialogue than Far Cry 6, more cinematics, sorry. Metro might have more cinematics than Far Cry 6. Okay. The Far Cry 6 is systemic, it's, a, it's an open world. Yeah, the, the scope is bigger than Far Cry 6. But let's put it in numbers. If both games were made in a similar amount of time, which is four years, but Metro Exodus was made by 150 people divided in two studios. Far Cry 6 was made by 850. So I want you everybody watching the video to look at metro exodus and to look at far cry 6 and if you can say the scope the overall scope of the game of far cry 6 is seven or eight times bigger than like is far cry 6 eight or eight times bigger than metro exodus or seven times bigger than metro exodus i really don't think so and this is where the budget disconnect comes right Far Cry 6 was made with a more efficient, a very tuned, very meticulous proprietary engine that was very well tailored for this type of game. That allows us to progress quickly, develop things quickly, and the technology that was Metro made uh, with was actually the more time passes, the more I was fond of the 4A engine. But then we go to the other side and Far Cry 6 was made with the Dunia engine, which is a real story. When I ask my first day in Ubisoft Toronto, I ask, so how's the engine? And my buddy, the person that was in charge of guiding me through the first process in the studio, just looked at me and said, well, uh, it's an engine, you know? And as we all worked, it, Dunia became this like monster we all had to carry. It was really difficult to work with. And, and they've been making Far Cry in the same engine since Far Cry 3. So it's Far Cry 3, Far Cry Blood Dragon, Far Cry 4, uh, Far Cry Primal, uh, Far Cry 5, Far Cry New Dawn. They've been making like all these Far Cries on the same engine. And it just was very difficult to work with. So the scope of Far Cry 6 comes from working in that engine. There was several designers we, we had requires three people to do the work of one person in Dunia. So why Ubisoft decided to work in this proprietary engine? Well, we know that Ubisoft Toronto used to work in Unreal for Splinter Cell Blacklist, but there was an issue there that I have not all the details, that they decided to abandon Unreal and go with proprietary technology. But they have not made good proprietary technology, in my experience, at least for Far Cry. And they were 
stubborn and adamant on using it because moving to another engine would cost millions of dollars. But they're working on Snowdrop now. Um, so the budget doesn't come from the design in this case. The scope of the game doesn't come from the design of Far Cry. It came from working in Dunia. The cost of making Far Cry was significantly bigger than Metro because working in Dunia. So who's more AAA in that sense? Well, money-wise, it's Far Cry, but are you getting seven times the game as Metro? No, there is a discrepancy there. So in that case, what does it mean to be AAA? And then let's bring that back, and then let's talk about the third point, that scope is many times dictated by trends. So we talked about in other videos, which you're going to find linked in the description below, about how the industry follows trends always. But we reach a boiling point in this method with the game as service. Because game as service increases the budget of your game in every single aspect. Even as a single player game, your budget becomes significantly bigger if you go through the game as service process. You know, so the budget of Dragon's Dogma, just the infrastructure of keeping servers lined up and keeping the back end just increased significantly. And it uses significant resources in the game just to have the online connectivity and the microtransactions. So that increases your budget. That definitely does. And I don't think there's been a trend that has increased the budget more than Game of Service. We talked about this before, but it's, it's good to bring it out. But the Game of Service asks the player to only play one game, which means that the markets get immediately saturated. Last year, people were hiring like crazy. Everything is growth, 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 and then everything started to go down. Last year, I was looking for a job myself. So I was interviewing studios everywhere. I don't know how many interviews I, I was having. As you get seniority in the video game industry, you start to get approached more by studios through LinkedIn and stuff. This is another video we want to make and it's like about how the recruitment process in the video game industry actually works. So, you know, in a way, how to get a job in the video game industry. We're going to make that video in the future. But in the meantime, you start to get interviews with several studios. This includes Sony, Gearbox, this many, 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 many studios. So what blew my mind and I was talking with friends is that for over a year after looking for a job and uh, landing in IO, I found that mm, around 90% of the studios were making game a service. 90% of them. And I'm telling you, I, I interview a lot, like a lot. And I talk with people that are in, in, in other studios and uh, they were also interviewing and they were all like, yeah, everybody's making game a service. And it's like, they, everybody followed this trend like never before. Like never before. I've never seen something like this. And it just crashed. It all came right crashing down. But if that's the case, if you think about it, a game of service, budget-wise, will immediately be called AAA. Immediately. It's like, this is a game of service, it immediately gets stacked as AAA. But the studio was not AAA before. It might have been an indie studio. It might have been like, everybody was taking it. Every size, you know, like, you're 50 people. I was working on a game of service that was made by 50 people. But that's immediately AAA. The scope was enormous. So you would have, like everybody watching this video and everybody outside of the development will catalog this game as AAA immediately because it's game of service. But it was made by 50 people. So what does AAA mean, you know, at this point? So this chasing of trends affects everybody equally, right? If the moment you make a, an indie game and you make it like, multiplayer like it, it, it is kind of what happened to the developers of Helldivers of course they grew thanks to Sony Helldivers you compare Helldivers 1 in a scope and you bring Helldivers 2 it's, 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 it's enormous the, the change right but they're still a small studio they're relatively small it's frustrating the final point 
it's the one that is harder to see. That is the behind the scenes deals. So we agree that the AAA uh, tag makes no sense. I hope that you guys agree with me. But let's call them big budget games. Even though what is a big budget, who knows? But we know there are certain companies that are willing to put like hundreds of millions of dollars, right? So let's say games that cost more than a hundred. So when you reach, like whenever a game gets financed, the reality is that it's not that simple. It's not like, oh, I'm a developer. I get a publisher. The publisher finances my project. And now that's it. The reality is that the game financing game, like a gig is actually a risk manage. It's all about risk management. It's just throwing the ball, a little ball called risk between certain people to see who takes the risk of this development. During Metro Exodus, it became quite controversy that Metro became a Epic Games exclusive. And people were like, oh, it's because they're just greedy. It's anti-consumer. People were saying, well, the reality is that Deep Silver didn't have that much money to make Metro because of the revolution tank. The Metro Exodus almost got canceled because of Homefront the Revolution. So there was a big pressure on the publisher for this game to be successful. And there was a huge risk involved. So Metro Exodus came out, became a huge success, by the way. It's like more successful than people think. But part of that gave us some security to work in Metro was that Deep Silver was able to grab that risk ball and put some of it on Epic on Epic Games by making it a Epic Game exclusive. So it actually helped the development of Metro Exodus a lot because they were able to put that little risk into someone else that had bigger pockets. And so all the time, you know, Sony, you hear all the time, a timed exclusive, for example, Final Fantasy VII Rebirth is a big one. People are saying like, it didn't sell well. Well, the reality is that we don't know. <laughs> digital figures, digital sales are becoming significantly bigger. And developers and publishers make more profit. In order to see if a game is successful or not, you need to see the digital sales as well. And we don't have that data for Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. But let's say like Final Fantasy VII Rebirth, it didn't sell that well. The reality is that Sony took a lot of that risk. Sony took a lot of the development money and took a lot of the risk, which Square Enix is fine with. Because as the game sells, depending on the deal they make, they are significantly protected from failure. Sony is not, but Square Enix is. And this is something you do when budgets tend to balloon. The risk becomes bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. So you, you try to become risk averse. You're trying to move that risk to someone else. So these are deals that we've all heard about, right? We all heard about all this, but the problem is when this, well, it's not necessarily a problem, but the things get slightly more confusing and more interesting when you realize that the biggest deals are with governments. So big developers will get money as tax incentives or straight up cash with governments from countries to make the, like to put studios in certain places or to release games that were developed in certain, in certain places. The number one, let's call it famous case right now is Skull and Bones. Skull and Bones was developed by Ubisoft Singapore and it has been in development, in complicated development for a long time. Why? Because of technology, because of budgets, volumen, because for everything we talked about. So what happens? The budget is ballooned. You know, so they try to mitigate the risk by putting it in the Singaporean government. Then they try to cancel the game. And then Singapore, and Singapore goes, no, you have to release this game. So they have to release the game. Which was complicated. So the majority of bigger, big game studios will have government grants or failure averse investment from governments. Uh, I know for a fact that big AAA companies had deals with the government of Ontario, Canada to put studios in Ontario. 
And I'm talking 300 to 700 million dollars deals that these big publishers had took to set up in Ontario. I know that for a fact, a lot of studios and a lot of companies left Vancouver when tax credits and tax incentives stopped being given to them in the city of Vancouver. So a lot of the risk would be thrown to governments, to actual government, to taxes, to your taxes. So if that's the case, what do we call those games? Do we call them AAA? I don't know. But these deals can backfire, right? The like government of Singapore being involved. Again, I have not 100% confirmation, but it was something that was talked about within Ubisoft. The budget balloons of Skull and Bones, because it's been developing and for forever with technology that doesn't fully work for what they need to do with a team that is like, huge in size because of the technology and because but boundaries don't exist Ubisoft comes out with a market employee to call it a quadruple A game because the whole development was difficult you know so what does that mean it means nothing it has never meant anything the term triple A is just a market employee don't use it Consumers should base their games on their matter, merits if they call to you, not on labels, especially not labels that talk about the money that was put to develop them. Labels should be about pitching games so you understand the game. So publishers and developers pitching games for you to understand the game better. It shouldn't be about telling you, oh, this game costs several million dollars to make you should play because of that it's not your responsibility to pay money for that it's the publisher's the responsibility and the developer's responsibility to scope their games correctly and plan for what it's possible to do with taking care of the health of their developers the term triple a makes no sense neither does the term indie this is santiago i'm a game designer in the game design perspective like comment subscribe tell me what you think am i crazy am i not did i tell you something that you didn't know have a good one